Chapter 3, The Cry of the Heart Yes, it had been raining, but we did not know about the hail. It was a freak of nature. One of those random western cloudbursts dumped a thousand frozen golf balls along a stretch of Highway 395, ten miles ahead, in preparation for our arrival. We were blasting south from Bridgeport on our way home from a fishing trip, making time in my buddy's Frank's 81 Ford Ecoline, one of those big old vans preferred by churches and kidnappers. We were going too fast coming around that bend, and the hail appeared too quickly for any real reaction. Whoa, what's that white stuff? Is that hail? By then, we were into our first 360, graceful as a figure skater, spinning over those big icy marbles into oncoming traffic in the irrigation ditch on the far side. The hippo ballerinos from Fantasia come to mind, behemoths cutting elegant turns as they spin and spin toward catastrophe. This took you longer to read than it took to happen. I put my hand on the dashboard to brace for the flip I knew was coming and prayed the only thing I could pray, the only thing I really needed to pray. Jesus! Next thing I knew, we were hanging upside down. Seat belts do work. Oil pouring in through the instrument panel. Windshield wipers going thump, thwack, thump, thwack. Because who remembers to turn off the wipers after you've rolled your van? Our stunned silence was broken by spontaneous laughter, flowing from that giddy, light-headed relief that follows a near head-on. Some prayers just happen. They are the cry of the heart. No training is needed when it comes to this kind of prayer. I've uttered it thousands of times. I'm confident you have too. Like when the phone rings and the bad news starts to spill and all you can do is say, Father, 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 your heart crying out to God. It's a beautiful expression of prayer rising from the deep places in us, often unbidden, always welcome to his loving ears. The Psalms are filled with this emotive praying. I cried out to God for help. I cried out to God to hear me. When I was in distress, I sought the Lord. Psalm 77, 1 to 2. Hear my cry, O God. Listen to my prayer. From the ends of the earth I call to you. I call as my heart grows faint. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. For you have been my refuge a strong tower against the foe. Psalm 61 verses 1 to 3. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and every day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? Psalm 13 verses 1 to 2. Doesn't something within you resonate simply reading those words of the psalmist? Our soul responds, yes, there is a kinship here. Words are being put to places we have known. Words like distress and my heart grows faint and refuge play like a bowstring on the cello of our hearts. As does how long. I let go a deep sigh I didn't even know was there. I didn't know I was holding my breath in that way. How long is a phase you run into places how long is a phrase you run into many places in the Psalms? It is so true to the human condition. In fact, the honesty of these prayers are, for me, one of the proofs for the authenticity of the Bible. I mean, if you were going to try starting a religion and you needed to convince the world to join your cause, I doubt you'd be nearly as gritty as the scriptures actually are. Nothing is cleaned up for the public here which is an enormous gift to us. There is permission here to have an emotional life and to bring it all to God. Pour out your hearts to him, for God is our refuge. Psalm 62, 8. The cry of the heart just comes if you let it. These are the prayers I find myself already praying as I'm waking up in the morning. Oh God, help. Help me today, Lord. Sometimes it's just one word repeated in my heart. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. I think it will just flow for you too if you give it permission. Turn the editor off. Let your heart and soul speak. In the Psalms, David is clearly unedited, 
unrestrained good grief in the psalms david is clearly unedited unrestrained good grief he's all over the map one moment it's i love you lord and the next why have you forsaken me i praise you o lord with all my heart i will tell of all your wonders i will be glad and rejoice in you i will sing praise to your name o most high psalm 9 verse 1 to 2 my god my god why have you forsaken me why are you so far from saving me so far from the words of my groaning psalm 22 verse 1 you almost wonder if it is the same person i find myself giving a quick glance to the top of the psalm to see if this is still david speaking and it is he he goes from his heart absolutely bursting with joy to utter desolation. You have filled my heart with greater joy than when their grain and new wine abound. Psalm 4 verse 7. My soul is in anguish. How long, O Lord, how long? Psalm 6 verse 3. One day he is writing ballads about the mighty victories of God. The next he is singing songs of lament and woe. How priceless is your unfailing love, both high and low among men find refuge in the shadow of your wings. They feast on the abundance of your house. You give them drink from the river of your delights. Psalm 36, verse 7 to 8. My heart is in an anguish within me. The terrors of death assail me. Psalm 55, verse 4. David's graphic confessions of sin and its ravages are among the most poignant in the literature of the world. My guilt has overwhelmed me, like a burden too heavy to bear. My wounds fester and are loathsome because of my sinful folly. I am bowed down and brought very low. All day long I go about mourning. My back is filled with searing pain. There is no health in my body. I am feeble and utterly crushed. I groan in anguish of heart. All my longings lie open before you, O Lord. My song is not hidden from you. My heart pounds, my strength fails me. Even the light has gone from my eyes. Psalm 38, verses 4 to 10. The humility soon vanishes, and he is crying out to God to bring apocalypse down on his enemies. The righteous will be glad when they are avenged when they bathe their feet in the blood of the wicked. Psalm 58, verse 10. Good heavens! He certainly isn't embarrassed by the world reading his journals. Nothing is hidden here. David quite lustily sails the seven seas of human emotion in his prayers. You couldn't get away with this in most churches. The man seems reckless, unstable. Your average board of trustees would have him sent to a therapist. But remember, David is called a man after God's own heart. It was God who made him king and canonized his prayers in the Bible. These psalms are given to the church as our prayer book, our primer, and they are beautiful, assuring us that not only can God handle the full span of our emotional life, he invites us to bring it to him. There was another man who learned these lessons well, a man in the line of David who clearly studied his primer. The unbridled strength of the Psalms resounds in the prayers of Jesus. Listen to this description I found buried in the book of Hebrews. During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with loud cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. Hebrews 5 verse 7. My prayers don't sound like that. They are not loud. And only on rare occasion are they accompanied by tears. Yet here is Jesus, the best man of all, more human than humanity, as G. K. Chesterton said. This here is how he prayed. I don't believe Gethsemane was the only time his disciples witnessed it. We have the account at Lazarus' tomb as well. But of course our thoughts turned to that famous grove of olive trees at the midnight vigil held there. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to them, Sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. 
Then he said to them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed. And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. Matthew 26, verses 36 to 39, Luke twenty two forty four. I find myself embarrassed by how formal my prayer life has become, how careful. As I read the Psalms and watch Jesus pray, I realize I am not allowing my heart's full range of emotion to express itself in my prayers, as if I have to somehow shield God from the full depth of the seas within me. There was a time in my life when my prayers sounded more like David's or like Jesus. A dear friend of mine had been killed in an accident, and there was no careful praying in the days that followed. I kicked a hole in the wall of the kitchen while praying, Fearful I would bring down the whole house, I would go out to the garage and take a baseball bat to a large plastic trash can in prayer. What are you thinking? I would yell with tears. How could you do this? I kept the door closed so as not to alarm the neighbors. It was without question the most honest time of prayer in my life. E.M. Bounds, that legendary 19th century prophet of prayer, wrote, the entire man must pray. The whole man, life, heart, temper, mind are in it. It takes a whole heart to do effectual praying. The whole man was involved in those prayers of mine in the garage. They were my cry of the heart. But over the years I toned it down. I became more, I don't know, reverent, careful, it seems silly even to write those words, but my prayers weren't loud and they no longer came with tears. So I decided that if God could handle David's full range of emotion, he could handle mine. Really, I think we have this feeling that we have to hide most of us when we come to God in prayer. Like a child tries to hide the mess he's made as he comes to his mother's call, even though she sees his muddy jeans, as if God doesn't already know. I began to take the editor off and let my prayers just flow from my heart. It was really a good shift. Not only did I feel far more connected to God, my heart to his, but my prayers took on a whole new power as well. The old saints called it unction. It's a word that means oomph. These prayers had oomph. Now let me be quick to say the cry of the heart is not only cries of heartache. It is not even primarily cries of sorrow or distress. It includes all sorts of joyful spontaneity and triumph as well. Joy can be loud too. Clap your hands, all you nations. Shout to God with cries of joy. Psalm 47 verse 1. My lips will shout for joy when I sing praise to you. Psalm 71 verse 23. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Psalm 91, Psalm 95, verse 1. In fact, shout to the Lord is used many times in the Psalms. Do you shout in your prayers? It will get you closer to Jesus' prayers, which were loud, may I remind you. You probably do this already, like when good news suddenly appears, when the doctor gives you a clean bill of health when you land the big promotion, when you're skiing, sailing, or on the downhill rush of the roller coaster. Whoop! You just didn't know you were doing it unto the Lord. But the cry of the heart is right there, and he loves it. I'm certain God and the angels shout right along with you. As Stacy and I have left behind the careful prayers of a quiet chapel, the music decibel has gone through the roof at our house in the last few years, we crank the worship, accompanied by all sorts of spontaneous whoops and hollers. The neighbors must think we have slipped the rails. The cry of the heart is not something you have to arrange for or practice or even learn. It doesn't require religious language. You do not have to kneel or close your eyes. And a good thing, too, because most of my praying takes place in the car or as I'm out walking in the woods. 
There needs to be nothing formal about it at all. In fact, do everything you possibly can to get rid of all formality, all those these and thous and religious posturing. Just give it permission. Those prayers are in there. Now, for a word of caution, be careful that your heart cries do not suddenly turn into agreements with despair or forsakenness. Don't let Father, I feel abandoned turn into an agreement with I am abandoned. It is such a relief to admit the anguish, but in this post-postmodern hour, where the minor theme of suffering and desolation has become the major theme, it is too easy to land in a place of heartache and call it authenticity. The emotions are real, and they matter, but emotions are not a safe harbor for the soul. Our enemy is always there in times of distress, trying to get us to agree with his lies. You are forsaken. The child who cries out in the dark feels very differently when his mother comes in and switches on a light. What felt so real and inevitable vanishes. Let us be careful we don't embrace the pain in such a way that we forbid God to turn on the light and draw near. Watch how David handles the stormy waters of his own soul. My tears have been my food day and night. While men say to me all day long, Where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul. How I used to go with the multitude, leading the procession to the house of God, with shouts of joy and thanksgiving among the festive throng. Why are you downcast, O my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. Psalm 42, verses 3 to 6. He admits it. He pours it all out with raw honesty. But he does not allow himself to stay there. Don't you love it that David talks to himself? Why are you downcast, O my soul? That makes me feel a little more sane because I talk to myself all the time. He reminds his own soul that things have not always been like this. And isn't that where we begin to make the fatal shift? When we are in the darkness, we begin to feel like we've always been there. But it is not true. David reminds himself that God has been faithful in the past. God will be faithful again. He urges himself to put his hope in God because the morning will come. The cry of the heart is a beautiful and precious form of prayer, but there is a danger to it, just as romance and friendship have their dangers. The honest release of emotions can at times become a whirlpool that sucks you in. I'm trying to keep you from making agreements while you give yourself permission to have a full emotional life with God. I feel forsaken is very, very different from I am forsaken. I feel overcome is much different than I am overcome. Notice how David escapes the shipwreck of the soul. He turns his attention from the debris of his life in a much healthier direction. He turns his gaze toward God. I call the Psalms our primer when it comes to prayer, and I did mean primer. There is more to learn and far more effective prayers to pray. We live in a very different moment in the story than David and his colleagues. A great deal has changed since the Psalms were penned. The incarnation, for one thing, the Son of God has come. Your ransom, for another. The cross has happened. The resurrection, too. Teutonic shifts have shaken the heavens and the earth, and those events change the posture of our praying in profound ways. The cry of the heart is one form of prayer, and a beautiful one. But there is another far more intentional, where we take up sword and shield and start changing the course of events through strong, determined prayer, the prayer of intervention, prayer that stops wildfires, prayer that ends droughts. We'll begin to explore that next.